All right, straight into it. Welcome back, folks, to another one of these sessions and an interesting one ahead of us, a more interactive one. So already first thing off the mark, be sure to uh, get your questions in because Henning has already said that he loves that kind of approach. But introducing Henning, who is he? What is he going to be talking about? Well, he is here to talk to us about an interesting subject, something called domain storytelling. So Henning, why don't you take it away? Yeah, Darren, thanks a lot. And welcome to this talk on domain storytelling, obviously. And uh, good morning, everybody, or um, good lunchtime, everybody. I'm not sure where you are. Um, storytelling um, is our topic for today, and stories are best fireplace. So please gather with me around this virtual fireplace here. And I want to um, get to you, what get you to think about our ancestors. Um, the cavemen in Stone Age, um, when they sat around their campfire in their cave. Let's imagine a tribe of, of these cavemen sitting in their cave in the winter outside. The wind is howling, howling, the snow is snowing and it's cold. So everybody is happy that they are sitting warm and comfy in their cave around the fire. On the other hand, it's also a bit boring sitting on the fire. So everybody's happy when one of the warriors stands up, one of the hunters stands up and tells the other members of the tribe how it used to be in the summer when they hunted the mighty bison, when they tracked it down and finally got it with their spears. And now in the winter, they are eating the flesh from this mighty bison. And when the hunter has finished his little story, then a silence comes up. And in the silence, the tribe members, they hear a scratch from the wall and they turn their heads. And on the wall, they see one of the other members of the tribe with a piece of coal and some animal blood. And he has painted a picture of that story that they just heard. And this picture you can see here, we can still see that now, 16,000 years later. This is a photograph from the cave of Altamira in Spain, one of the earliest pieces of human art. And of course, we're not sitting in caves anymore, but still, it's kind of about the same thing that we want to do. We still want to spark a fire tell a story and paint a picture. Of course, the fire that we're sparking that we want to gather around um, our people, there's usually not a real fire anymore and it's not burning in a cave, but um, it's in a meeting room, something like a whiteboard or uh, another modeling space. And the story is not told by hunters anymore. The story is told by our users by our domain experts. And the picture is not painted on the cave wall and not with animal blood with coal, but usually with whiteboard markers on a whiteboard. And you can see my colleague Stefan here doing a domain storytelling session. Stefan is not here today, so you will have to get along with me. My name is Henning Schwendner, and I work um, as a coder, coach, and consultant at a company called WPS. Coder, coach, consultant, that means when I'm lucky, I get my hands on the keyboard. But of course, the salary rise is when you go to the right here. And that's why I um, spent most of my working days with what I'm doing with you, telling people about software development, telling people how to do it right with programming, with software architecture, or how I think what's right with software architecture, with programming. And there's two sides of the coin um, training. That's what I'm doing with you now, working in theory and exercises with teams. And the other part is consulting, working with teams on their piece of software. And typically that means today modernizing, modernizing that software, modularizing that software. The big topic for me, like for many others in the industry is taking the monolith and splitting it up into smaller pieces, maybe into microservices. 
And for me, as a technical person, what I like especially about that is that I see many different people and also many different technologies, many different programming languages. Because to be honest, all the programming languages, they are equally well suited to build monolithic software. So there's always this fight between Java and the .NET platform. They're equally well suited for building a monolith. Now, of course, one language is missing here that should be COBOL up right here. That's the language which is best for a monolith. Yeah, I work for WPS in Germany, in Hamburg. Um, we're the ones with the touch table. And talking about caveman, that's nice. But of course, we're here to build software. And let's look at a story that helps us build software. Or let's look at a domain. Let's look at um, an area where we want to build software for. And that story um, starts with Bob. Bob is a victim of Dieselgate and wants to get rid of his old combustion engine car. And Bob wants to buy a new shiny electrical car. Bob has one problem though, and that is he doesn't have any money in his pocket. He goes to his car dealer nonetheless and asks him the question, well, I don't have money, do I still get a car for this? And of course, Bob's afraid that he will get the answer, no way. But as you know, car dealers, they are inventive people and car dealer tells Bob, well, I do have a solution for your problem. And that is called leasing, car leasing or auto leasing. So you don't have to buy the car yourself, but we, the leasing company, we are going to buy the car for you and then we are going to rent it to you for a monthly rent or a monthly installment for a monthly payment. So we're not only having the car manufacturer here making the car and the end customer, Bob, buying that car, but now we get Another party in the middle, that's our leasing um, company. The leasing company is buying the car and then they are leasing it um, to our Bob, to our end customer. So we now have three parties. Mm -hmm. And I think what we all can easily imagine is that this leasing, leasing company has a piece of software that supports their work and that this piece of software is of course old and it's called filling the monolith. And monolith is, of course, a monolithic piece of software, 20 years, 25 years, maybe 30 years old. And it's done, it's worked through these years pretty well, but today, well, it doesn't fit to the needs that we have today. For example, if we want to go to the cloud, if we want to develop with different teams on that, well, the monolith, well, that's kind of hard to work with. So that's why the leasing company wants to split up their monolith. And um, what does this have to do with domain storytelling? Well, to split up the monolith, um, the first thing to do is to put that monolith aside and to think about the domain, to think about what is the software actually built for? What is the problem that we are going to solve? So we have to understand the business process, we have to understand the domain. So how is the business process working in our leasing company? It starts with our customer, uh, which, and the customer tells his wish for a car to a salesperson. And then the salesperson will calculate the installment for the contract. Installment, that means the payment, the money that is to be paid monthly and by the customer. If the customer says, well, I can afford that installment, then he will sign the contract. And after the contract is signed, the salesperson passes on that contract to a risk manager because the risk manager now has to check the risk. So they will first check the credit rating. That is the risk of the customer. And then the risk manager will calculate the resale value that's the risk of the car. And based on these two factors, the risk manager votes the contract. To vote means say, yes, we want to do this contract or no, this contract, um, the risk for this contract is too high, we can't do it. And let's assume the 
risk manager says, yeah, the risk is low enough. We want to do this contract. So the risk manager says, yes. Then our salesperson will then give out the car to our customer. So what we can see here, that is a first domain story. And remembering our caveman, we still still this is still a bit that's the same. We sparked a fire where we gathered around people, that is developers and domain experts. And we told a story. We let our domain experts tell their story. It's called domain storytelling because we want our users, our domain experts, tell their story. And then third, we painted a picture. That's usually something that we do, we developers. We paint a picture, we paint a diagram and show this is what I have understood. Did I understand you right with this stuff? So let's look into more detail with that. Let's look at domain storytelling explained. So first, it's important to understand that domain storytelling is about collaboration. So what we're doing with domain storytelling is part of a larger family of methods which is called collaborative modeling. Collaborative modeling because we want to model together and modeling because we want to build a domain model. We want to understand the domain so we can then build our software. With that. So collaboration has to take place between two groups especially, and that is the developers, that's us, and the domain experts, them. These two groups of people we want to bring together. Very important that these two groups of people are in the same room or today in the same Zoom call, and they should work together on the knowledge. So this is also called knowledge crunching, term from DDD, because the idea is we want to chew on that knowledge, on the domain knowledge, until the juice comes out. So the juice, that's the essence. That's where we want to go. So there are different methods for this collaborative modeling stuff, user story mapping, event storming, you might have stumbled upon them. And then there's domain storytelling, what we're looking at now. And what's important is that domain storytelling is a combination of two things. here. One thing is the pictographic language and the other thing is the workshop font. So the pictographic language, we've already seen that, stick figures and arrows. Oh, that's nice, but equally important, at least equally important is the workshop format because it's so important to get the right people together. That's the single most important thing when working with domain stories, but actually uh, when building software, we have to understand what's happening in the business. And that means we have to bring together the right people and who are the right people well, of course, Chuck Norris, he's always the right people, but usually he can't make it. He doesn't have the time because he has to save the world or do some stuff. So who is the right people then? If Chuck can't make it, then we need two groups, and that is the storytellers, the people that want to share knowledge, and the listeners, the people that want to learn something. These two groups we want to bring together. Usually storytellers, those are people from the domain, and listeners are people from tech developers. But it's not as black and white because naturally, if you work as a developer for a time in a domain, then you become kind of a domain expert yourself and you can get into this role of storyteller. And on the other hand, when we have several domain experts in such a workshop, in such a session, then these domain experts, they will also learn something from each other. So that's why we need storytellers and listeners. And then there's typically a third role that is the moderator. Um, that's the person who leads the discussion and um, who then models the diagram, draws the diagram on the wall so that we have a common picture of what's happening. And talking about the right people, we want to have people that really understand the business, that really understand what's happening in the business. And that's why we don't want to have fairy tales told. So that means we need people that come from the trenches, people that really do the work, 
managing management can help, but we have to be careful. We don't need managers to tell us, well, this is how I would wish for this work to be done, or this is how use work used to be done before I got promoted. Well, that's maybe interesting, but more interesting is how is the work done today? That's the work that we want to support with our software, right? So no fairy tales told. And um, <clears throat> what is the reason that we have this storytelling um, idea? The reason is that software development is so hard because misunderstanding is so easy, misunderstanding each other. So this is software development in one picture. This is our user and this is us. This is what our user is wishing for. Well, I get this flying horse. Yeah, and well, this is what he gets usually when we're done with our job. So it's also about expectations management. We want to bring together the ideas that the domain expert, the user on the one hand has and the developer has on the other hand. So we want to move our understanding as close to the real domain as possible. Okay, and that's why we are using storytelling, the simple idea that everybody knows about um, and <clears throat> everybody is used to telling stories, hearing stories that everybody um, is used to, every human being. So the basic idea is we let the domain experts tell their story. That means they say sentences like the salesperson passes on the contract to the risk manager. And when we hear that sentence, we simply draw that sentence into our diagram. So you can see here, the salesperson hands over the contract to the risk manager. And what you can see here, if you look closely, is that even in this small sentence, there's a first misunderstanding. And that's what we want to get rid of. So now by drawing the sentence that we have heard, we show our user, this is what I have understood. And then I can ask the question, did I understand you right? And my business expert, my user can object and say, well, you didn't get me quite right. I didn't say the salesperson hands over the contract, but I said the salesperson passes on the contract and hand over, pass on. Well, in my domain, this means two different things. These are the small and subtle differences in language that we want to know about and that we want to understand. Because these small and subtle differences and misunderstandings, they add up to the big misunderstandings that lead to software that is um, maybe technically excellent, but not fitting, not really fitting to what our domain is about. So that's why we have to be very exact here. So we could say that um, a technique for active listening. Active listening means um, not just listening by saying yes, 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 and nodding your head, but by um, um, listening in a way that you repeat what you have understood. One possibility is to repeat in your own words what you have understood. That's called paraphrasing. Another possibility is to repeat what you have understood by showing that as a diagram, drawing that down what you have understood. That's what we are doing here. So active listening, and we're using storytelling because storytelling is something that everybody's used to, not only technical people. So that's why we are using a special notation, not this um, only already existing notations like BPMN or UML, because those are notations that are well suited for communications between developer and developer. But here we need a notation that's um, well suited to have communications between developer and real people, normal people, business experts, people that are not used to um, technical stuff like loops or conditionals. So that's why we're using a special notation and that's why we're using storytelling because everybody of us already heard, for example, fairy tales like here, Hansa and Gretel, 
on the lap of our grandmother. I don't know if that's is is that a fairy tale that's told in Lithuania? Maybe you can write that into the chat. It's a typical um, fairy tale that's told um, in the country where I come from in, in Germany. And storytelling, we're using that, not abstract processes. And we need a special pictographic language, which is simpler than the notations DPMN and UML. And the idea is that we basically have only three elements, two kinds of icons and one kind of arrow. And that's it, more or less. So we have the actors, the stick figures, the people that are doing something. That's icon type number one. And then we have the work objects, the things that our actors are working on. That's icon type number two. And then we have the activities. That is... Uh, what we are doing. So the actor does an activity with a work object. That's a typical sentence. And then we have another element that's, that's called the sequence number, sequence number that brings the time into our diagrams. Okay. Um, we can use different icons for these different um, things for the actors and work objects. Um, for example, in our story, we had a different icon here, this dollar sign for the installment and a car sign for our car. And obviously we can do that with our, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, with our actors as well. So for example, sometimes we have one person acting, sometimes we have a group of people acting and even IT systems can be actors in our domain story. Okay, when you look at that um, simple pictographic language, these simple elements, then you might also see what's not part of that language. And that is conditionals. We do not have if else, we have, don't have switch case, we don't have or. And that's deliberately, that's by intention, because we don't want to make one picture, one domain story too complicated. And thinking about storytelling, stories are not told in that way. We don't say, if the sun is shining, Hansel and Gretel go out into the forest and the bad witch catches them. Or if it's raining, Hansel and Gretel stay at home and the big bad wolf comes and eats them up. That's not how fairy tales, that's not how stories work. So we want to tell one story, we want to tell, we want to draw one diagram um, that tells one story. And if we want to look at different cases, then we draw another story. That means typically a domain story doesn't come alone, but it comes um, in a group. So usually we draw a handful or two handful of domain stories to understand a domain. And that means one picture doesn't tell everything. It just tells one story, one scenario. So that's why called why main storytelling is also called a scenario-based uh, modeling method because one picture is one scenario. Domain storytelling isn't the only method that's this like this, um, but for domain storytelling, it's very important to have this idea of well, we're telling one story in one picture, and that means on the other hand that one picture um, can be easily understood and can be understood as a whole. So we don't want to have too many steps in, in one story. So that's one reason why we have several stories, scenario-based modeling. And another reason is uh, the so-called scope, which is made up of several factors. One factor is the granularity. So are we telling a coarse grained story or are we telling a fine-grained story? Coarse grain means, oh, well, we look up from a bird's eye perspective and we only see the big steps. That may be interesting, usually if we want to get an overview over a domain. And then fine grain domain stories, they are also interesting if we want to go into more details, if we want to know more what's happening there. For what we are going today, uh, finding boundaries for microservices, for for teams, 
there it's usually a good idea to stay with a coarse grained or maybe medium grained granularity. So one scope factor is granularity. Another scope factor is the point in time. Are we modeling the process today or are we modeling the to be process? And then there's also domain purity. Um, I'm going to talk about that later a bit. Okay, then we can see that we can use different tools for domain storytelling. So I use PowerPoint here so far. Another tool that I'm going to use now is Egan IO. Those are online tools, but you don't need a computer. You can do it on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper, as you can see here in several pictures or something in between, um, like digital whiteboards. I also personally like um, this combination here, Miro um, with an iPad. OK, um, but talking in theory is one thing. More interesting um, is doing it in practice. And that's why I want to do a little exercise. And since I have no direct uh, connection to you with the audience, Darren um, is so nice to be my interview partner. here. Oh, so, goody. Uh, I'm the test monkey. <laughs> you are the test monkey. Yeah. Thanks a lot again <laughs> for, no problem. For, for being that. Um, OK, so um, I want to do a little exercise. and. That means let's roll up our sleeves and then we need a domain that we are all experts in. And that's why I want to look at this story here. How do we travel by train from a city A to a city B? And yeah, I switch to, oh, where is it? There we go. And um, to this tool that I was talking earlier about, this Egan IO. And yeah, travel from city A to City B by train. Okay, how would you do that? Okay, uh, so I, I guess I should get ready to leave the house first of all, or we like assume all that's done, right? Like you know, get mm -hmm. your stuff packed, make your way out. Well, yeah. So we'll have to start and... there, and then uh, you know, step one is I'm going to order a taxi because I'm lazy. Uh, okay, it's the train station. And then so I, I, um, I tried to write down the, the preconditions that you said you already left the house, you packed the stuff. Yep. And then you're ordering a taxi. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have the right symbol now. Okay. okay and, and then? And then, uh, of course, it's going to take me to the train station. And yeah. Obviously, pay the, the taxi driver, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, head inside to order my tickets. Okay, yeah. I leave the payment out here from the taxi, so we stay on a on a course grind level, mm -hmm. um, because uh, we we don't have much time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so then then you um yeah, then you said you were going to buy the tickets. Um, who are you going to buy the tickets from? Uh the machine in the train station. Because I'm very unorganized and decide to do it very last second. Um, and that sounds like there are other possibilities as well. Yep, um, you could uh, you could order them online, um, and then they could be printed out, or you can use your phone. Um, there would also be the desk. You could go to the desk and get them printed out by a physical person yeah um but i am so. uh, you know i'm i'm your typical basement dwelling gamer so i don't want to talk to other people of course um, <laughs> so I, I write down these alternatives buying the ticket um online or at a desk yeah. um from a real person okay and okay. We 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 all for this time being we, we said you are ordering a taxi you are buying the ticket who are you what what's your role in that story me I I'm the protagonist clearly you know I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a, a fuel in the action so I, I guess main character right yeah to to boldly give myself that role 
Okay, then, then let's start with protagonist um, and come back to that point later. So um, now you've, uh, the protagonist has bought the ticket from the machine and then what happens next? Uh, and then I have to wait for the train to arrive. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's English train, so it's probably going to be late by at least 15 minutes. Yeah, okay, that, that sounds like German train, trains. <laughs> yeah, we got it in common. <laughs> Also overpriced. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, but uh, that's changing in Germany. Actually, there's some a new program there. It's called the nine euro ticket. They are working on it for on that. Okay, but let's not go too deep into that. So the protagonist waits for the train, and then, mm -hmm. uh, and then I get told it's going to be delayed by another five minutes. But it eventually gets there, and then of yeah. course, like I board it, I get on top, uh, on board it. Mm -hmm. So you board the train, uh, boards, train, yeah, and then? And then the train is going to go on its merry way uh, towards my destination. I'll stop off yeah. at several places along the way, though. Yeah. Okay. And, and who is making the train going on that, on that uh, merry way? Ah, the conductor. Yes, the conductor is driving the train. Okay, conductor. Um, you know, it's a good thing I bought a ticket, or that would be our antagonist in this story when he comes around and asks for that ticket. And uh... <laughs> 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 okay, so um, we're going to come to that in a second. So you said that the driver drains, drives the train to the destination. I think that was your yeah word. Um, of course, with um, our protagonist. And then there's somebody um, who's doing something with a ticket, right? Yes. Yes. So the, the conductor will also come around and check your tickets to make sure that you aren't okay. trying to get a free ride. Okay. So, and that's the same person? Yeah, usually it's the same person because the trains are semi automated. Checks. I mean, Take I don't want to mean their role, but they just push your lever and move uh, move out of the cabin, you know? Okay. Cool. So then the, the, the conductor checks the ticket from the protagonist, and then? Uh, and then I take a nap, or, or maybe I'll go on uh, my Nintendo Switch until I mm -hmm. reach my destination. Okay. Or maybe I'll open uh, my phone and go on Twitter and complain about how bad the trains are. You know, it, it, yeah. <laughs> one of the three. <laughs> okay, so, I, I, as I said, we, we are focusing um, in, in one domain story only on one case. So, yep. um, uh, what, what, what would be the the most likely of the um, three? I guess I'll be on my phone, right? So, okay. doing things on your phone to pass the time. Okay. And I write down um, things on the phone. Uh, okay. And then, uh, and then, and then eventually the, the train's going to like, you know, stop off on the way at several destinations, but I'll yeah. keep doing things on my phone because, you know, I'm addicted. I clearly can't look away for it for more than two minutes. Yeah. And eventually the train will stop at my destination and I'll get off. Okay. Um, I write that down as protagonist um, gets off at. I get no get off train at destination. Sorry. Okay, and you said that the train stops at the destination. That's probably also something that the conductor does, right? Yes, the conductor yeah. will stop the train each time. Well, maybe it's just stops train. And um, this should be obviously before the protagonist gets off, right? So this has to be step number eight. Right. 
Okay. I mean, I hope the train stops before I get off. Otherwise, oh, uh, of course, yeah. Gonna <laughs> do my knees in. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'm going to write down here is we started with a coarse grain and um, process, and also what we did was we looked at the standard case. It's mm -hmm. typically something that you're going to start with. Um, and the next thing would be, okay, let's now look at all the, the obstacles that could happen um, to our way and uh, what, uh, what happens if the train does not um, arrive or um, if I uh, does, do things on my phone too long and then I, I miss the, the destination stuff. And of course, there's, there's a, lot of, a bunch of, of things that can happen there. Okay, thanks a lot. So I'm going to, to replay that. So it starts with the protagonist ordering a taxi to the train station. And then the protagonist buys tickets from the machine, waits for the train, boards the train. The conductor drives the train to the destination with the protagonist. The conductor checks the ticket from the protagonist. The protagonist does things on his phone. The conductor stops the train. And then the protagonist gets off the train at the destination. Is that basically it? Uh, yeah, uh, my life, my life in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes exchange train for for airplane, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, airplane there uh, uh, quite frequently, but yeah. then um, of, of course, in those situations, there's more of a rush. You don't want to be late. Um, but yeah, the the, the I, I guess now the, the whole thing you're saying is then as you go through these, and you do more iterations, you explore the ifs, buts, and maybes, right? Like the yeah. taxi doesn't turn up. Or yeah. a giant dinosaur attacks the train. Um, exactly. What, what's happening happen. there? And to, to look at that, those cases, then I would usually press here the add tab button and then um, yeah, tell another story. And mm. maybe I would start with a copy of this story and look at that cases, or maybe start from scratch from, from scratch and then see, okay. Um, giant dinosaur attacks train and then we we look at um, what's what's happened there okay i i can't when you're looking <laughs> so um text. okay but of course we don't have the time now to to look at those no, that, interesting that would go pretty deep i think yeah. my imagination <laughs> would not let that be less than 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> okay awesome um, thank you for um, for the start. So we got a, a common understanding of, of what's happening here. And we got a lot of, um, oh, there's a word miss missing here. We got a lot of domain language here as well, which is also awesome. So we talked about tickets and trains and destinations. Um, and we didn't talk about technology so far. And that's good because we want to focus on the problem first. And then we want to move on to um, how do we build a, um, a solution for this problem now? How do we build, um, in, in our case, um, a, a computer program for that? So, and um, you can do different things here. You can use domain stories for different purposes. For example, for learning the language, we already started with that. And we can use it for working on requirements, implementing a domain model. But we don't have the time for that today. So we focus on this year on drawing boundaries here. We want to draw boundaries into our domain story. So um, uh, here, we want to draw boundaries into our domain story so we can find where can we build different microservices for our monolithic software, which are the, the, the things that we want to split up. And also, what could the teams be that we have here? So drawing boundaries, that means that we look from a coarse grain perspective, from an outside view onto our domain story, and then we build bounds, draw boundaries. It doesn't have to be as hard boundaries as here. We don't want to separate people, of course. But we want to separate models from each other. So, and what we are going to do is go back to our domain story. So this is our leasing example, and ask the question, um, which activities belong together from an actor's perspective. And I would say, well, here, um, the steps one, two, three, and eight, they belong together. 
and they form what we call a subdomain, which could be called sales. And then we have the steps five, six, and seven. They form another subdomain, which could be called risk assessment. And what we are going to do now in our leasing company is to say, well, we're not building the monolithic piece of software, the one big leasing system anymore, monolith, but we're building one module sales and one module risk and probably several other modules as well. And we can say, well, we have also one team for sales and one team for risk assessment. We can build microservices here and so on, all this stuff here. And when you think about it, what we're doing here is vertically cutting our software. Vertically, not horizontally. So we're not talking about layers here because both sales and, and, and risk, they both have all the layers. They all have, both have UI, business logic, and database layer. So the question to ask here is which activities belong together um, from an actor's perspective. And sorry, no, this is a German slide that I didn't want to show you. Uh, what we can do then is we extract from our domain story or usually our domain stories, um, our bubbles here, sales and risk assessment and put them into another diagram, which is called a context map, because we have the bounded contexts here. That's a word from DD from domain driven design. And there we get a course overview of the architecture of our system. Okay, so we did it with leasing. Now let's go back to um, our um, example and let's draw boundaries into our, where is it? Into our train story. So if we look at that, um, Darren, if you um, like, um, we could have a look at this again and see, well, where could we draw boundaries here? And yeah, also the audience, if you like, you can write something to the chat and say, well, um, think about this, think about that. Um, I would say, for example, this is what we are doing here, um, buying a ticket from the machine um, that forms one of these subdomains. We could um, call that um, ticket sales, for example. Uh, and that's something else than what is happening here with the ticket. Um, again, we have the ticket here, but um, that's maybe the ticket control or the ticket check. We would have to talk about the words here. And yeah, thinking about the other, oh, sorry, the other activities that we have here, um, maybe we could have something like uh, the train driving down here what the conductor does here, driving the train, stopping at the destination. And um, then um, maybe we put um, this uh, taxi thing into its own domain and all the other stuff is maybe um, the traveling itself and we put that into one domain here. What we can see now is that we drew some boundaries into our process and those boundaries, they can help us build a system. Oh, this should be part of this as well. Um, so, when we think about the system that we are going to build for our um, for our train, um, then we would say, well, not the monolithic train system anymore, but we build a ticket sales module and a ticket control module. Okay. With that, back to the slides. Um, I I'm going to come to an end. Old. If my slides let me do that, come to the conclusion. 
Um, and that is, if you want to know more about this, go to Domain Storytelling Org, or even better, buy this book by Stefan and me, Domain Storytelling, a collaborative visual and agile way to build domain-driven software. And with that, the end is near. Usually I would give away swag, but we don't see us in real life. So I just can say, please rate this session. Of course, best is if you press the green button. And thank you. Happy end. That's it. And I'm here for questions if they are on. Hey, thank you, Henning. That was uh, really actually interesting uh, to listen to. Um, thank you for uh, getting me involved. It's always fun to, to be more than just the head that says hello. Uh, that was, I, I like that because it's the, the approach is very kind of relatable. As we were talking about before we came on stage, you know, this. If, when we talk in big technical terms and we kind of get into the, the jargon a lot, people get alienated. Um, I remember I experienced that when I first got into software mm -hmm. dev where I've been, mm -hmm. I've been coding for years, but I didn't know what the four pillars of object-oriented programming was. And, I, and then someone explained to me, I was like, I've been doing those for years, right? Like, so it's, it's nice when you're able to relate to things uh, more practically. So I love that. We do have a question coming in from Nikolaus. He asks, uh, hi, can you explain more about the horizontal split on the development? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I jumped over that quickly. So what I said is um, what we are using um, this technique here for uh, domain storytelling when we want to find microservices and, and, and boundaries uh, uh, for teams is that we're doing it vertically. So what we um, want to do also is split horizontally. But um, when we have this microservices idea, when we have this bounded context idea from strategic design of, of DED, um, then it's important that we start with the vertical stuff first. And that means um, that we will not have only data, uh, one database or one UI, but typically we will have several of these. And that's um, one of the or maybe the uh, important thing um, and uh, that you have to learn when you start with microservices that, well, this architecture is going to be <laughs> pretty different from the monolithic software that we used to build in the old days. In the old days, we said, well, we have to have this one big database because this is our one truth. And with microservices, with strategic design, we're saying, well, not exactly anymore. <laughs> We do not have the one big model anymore, which is slow and big and not to understand. So, but we want to have several of, of these models. And that means when we have the vertical cut made first, then we are going to do the horizontal cut inside of our microservice and have maybe an UI layer and a business logic layer and a database layer inside. If you are doing um, layered architecture, if you ask me, move on from <laughs> layered architecture to more modern styles that we have today. That is hexagonal architecture, onion architecture, clean architecture, whatever you name it, um, which have um, a, an idea of the world which is further than the uh, up and down that we have in the layered architecture, which moves up this above below to an inside outside idea. Inside we have the domain layer and the domain layer doesn't know anything about technology, and then from the outside, we plug on the database, we plug on the UI. But that goes beyond the topic of, of this talk. If you're interested in that, I could give you some links in, in the chat later. Okay, okay uh, well, in, in that case, I, I think we're running over a little bit. Um, Rose, yeah, yeah, as I say, Raz, I just wanted you to quickly show the, the overview again. Uh, by the way, folks, if there's anything that you missed in in these presentations, if you want to go back, they will be available after the conference for people who bought tickets to view, uh, as well as people who hadn't bought tickets at a, uh, a certain price. So you will be able to check these back. And I'm sure you can easily um, access Henning. I'm sure he has some some social medias or somewhere where you can send him messages if you have follow-up questions, because I, I, I think we should probably kind of cut it to an end here as we are actually running over for a change, which is nice. It's refreshing. There's good conversations going on, but I know a, a bunch of people are probably getting hungry. They're thinking it's dinner time or, or lunchtime at least. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll bring it to a close. If you haven't checked out his book already, plenty of good stuff, obviously judging by the preview here, Domain Storytelling, 
definitely seems like a worthwhile read from Henning. So give that a check. And uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to him. But Henning, thank you for your time. It has been a pleasure to talk with you. And it has also been a pleasure to be your guinea pig. Um, had a good time of it. Yeah. And thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for that being my guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, buddy.